You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 14th of December. Hate cleric Abu Qatada quits his £400,000 taxpayer-funded home. Verizon files patent for cable box that watches you as you watch. Judge credits knife-wielding thug for not killing his victim. Labour councillor Sandu employs illegal immigrants. Miss France slammed for being white as snow. Anti-Islam voices gather strength in France. Nick Griffin, MEP from the belly of the beast. American communist Islamofascist sympathisers are wringing their hands. Proposed army manual tells GIs not to insult Taliban and ignore paedophilia. China to overtake EU and US by 2030, US intelligence says. Thought for the day, misandry and how our media uses it. And finally, goat in boots. UK News. Hate cleric Abu Qatada quits his £400,000 taxpayer-funded home only to move into another. The 52-year-old Islamic fanatic is fighting deportation to Jordan on terror charges, and it was hoped he was being put on a plane to the Middle East. But instead, he is believed to have been handed an even larger gaff in London with his wife and five children after leapfrogging to the top of the waiting list. The terror suspect said he needed to escape demonstrations over his marathon fight to avoid being booted back to his native Jordan. Yesterday, he was escorted from his five-bedroom taxpayer-funded home in North London by two plain-clothes cops and reportedly taken to an even bigger house in an undisclosed location, still in the Greater London area. Fellow Tory MP and security expert Patrick Mercer stated, There are ex-service personnel who have been made redundant and are waiting for housing. They must wonder what is going on. Verizon files patent for cable box that watches you as you watch television. Another reason not to own a TV via Yahoo News. A Verizon patent idea envisions spying on TV viewers for the sake of serving up related ads. For instance, a couple snuggling in front of the TV could end up getting bombarded by commercials for romantic vacations, flowers or even birth control. The system could also detect a person's mood or identify objects such as pets, soft drink cans or a bag of chips in a person's hand, and room, decorations or furniture. Such a patent idea would turn TV set-top boxes into spy boxes with sensors for both seeing and hearing the activity in front of the television. Many TV viewers already own such set-top boxes to access pay-per-view services, digital video recordings and internet streaming. Verizon also operate a mail system compatible with other well-known email sites, including AOL, Hotmail, Outlook Express and Lotus Notes. Judge credits knife-wielding thug for taking care not to inflict life-threatening injuries on a victim he stabbed five times. Hu Pang Wong, 25, who has two previous convictions for possessing a knife, stabbed Carlos Fredericks three times in his right thigh, once in his left thigh and once in his left armpit. Recorder Michael Hunter, sitting at Kingston Crown Court, sentenced Wong to seven years in jail for wounding with intent. He told him he would be failing to protect the public if he did not pass a substantial custodial sentence, but gave him credit for using the knife in the way he did. He said, I take into account four of the wounds and two of the deep wounds were deliberately made by you on the legs. I'm therefore giving you credit for the fact that when you use the knife the way you did, you were taking care not to inflict life-threatening injuries, although I am aware that such injuries can cause death. I can only hope that when you are released from prison, you will use your potential and never return to prison again. A nationalist spokesperson said, send him back to China. They'd probably shoot him over there. Labour councillor Sandu employs illegal immigrants. The border agency is surprised Labour councillor Sandu employs illegal immigrants. The border agency, in a surprise raid, arrested four women and one man at a factory run by Labour councillor Balbir Singh Sandu in Derbyshire. 
The factory, Star Clothing, operating in Normanton, was raided after a tip-off to the border agency. Labour councillor Balbur Singh Sandhu commented on the border agency's inquiries, They can check what they want to check. I have nothing to hide. A fine of £10,000 per worker could be imposed by law if found guilty. Tower Hamlets pays £600 for Labour councillors' acting lessons. Tower Hamlets sent Labour councillor Mirzan Chowdhury for acting lessons to the Royal Academy after he was voted as first speaker. They paid £600 so that Chowdhury could be more convincing in his role as Tower Hamlets' unofficial ceremonial mayor. Chowdhury was criticised earlier this year after the council reimbursed him over £9,000 for taxi bills. Tory leader councillor Peter Golds has called for a full investigation. European news. Miss France slammed for being white as snow. This week, a black rights group has slammed the latest Miss France competition for producing a white as snow winner from a field it claimed was unrepresentative of the country's ethnic makeup. Marine Lothelin, 19, a brunette medical student from Burgundy, was on Saturday crowned Miss France 2013, having edged out Miss Tahiti, Hinarini de Longo, in the final round of judging. Louis Georges Tain, the president of the CRAN, Representative Council of Black Associations, on Monday lamented the lack of contestants from France's African and North African communities. The failure to represent the contemporary French population in an event such as this is obviously serious, Tan said in his statement issued jointly with Fred Royer, the creator of Miss Black France. It amounts to denying the very existence of French people of African origin. Of the 33 finalists in Saturday's contest, eight were from ethnic minorities, with six of those coming from France's Pacific or Caribbean territories. In the antiquated world of Miss France, blacks apparently can only come from overseas departments, the Cran statement said. As for French women of North African heritage, they were represented by only one candidate, who was quickly eliminated. France is home to around 5 million Muslims, most of them of North African origin. The statement went on to express regret that Miss France is as white as the end-of-year snow on the steeples of an eternal France. A World Date reporter commented, Ridiculous as these witterings are, people are missing the point here. It shows that nothing short of a complete takeover in which whites and non-Muslims are totally ignored will be tolerated by these newcomers. They do not seem to realise that France was one of the most colour-tolerant countries in Europe, that is, of course, unless the Muslims get their way with, with religious intolerance, which spreads further than beauty contests. France, where the anti-Islam movement is spreading like wildfire. Anti-Islam acts have increased by 42%, compared to the first 10 months of 2012, according to a provisional report of the Observatoire contre l'Islamophobie. A newly elected French president, François Hollande, has shown no desire to do anything about it. Hundreds of French patriots in Paris came out to protest against Islamization of their country, chanting the French anthem and saying that Islam has no place in their country. There has been a multiplication and a banalization of desecrations, denounces Mohamed Moussaï, president of the CFCM, French Council of the Muslim Religion. The most striking action was the occupation on the 20th of October of the construction site of the Poitiers Mosque by a far-right group. For the first time, people sang warlike anti-Islam slogans openly, stresses M. Masai. We have reached a new level. Faced with these threats at the beginning of October, the CFCM demanded a solemn declaration from President François Hollande against the rise in Islamophobia. So far, he has remained silent. Over half the Belgian immigrants not registered for work. More than half of Belgium's non-EU immigrants are not registered to work, according to a report published Tuesday by the country's National Bank. The report found that 45% of immigrants were in work, the lowest in Europe, way below the 58% average. Immigrants make up 14% of the Belgian population. MSM News reported an improvised bomb was left at a railway station in Bonn, allegedly placed there by Salafists. Fortunately, it was never detonated. The building was blocked off around 2pm, train traffic was suspended, and police investigated the bag. After several hours, the bag was blasted with water cannon. 
Inside there was a clock with connected wires connected to it and some metal bowls filled with powder. Later on it was said that the bag contained potential flammable material and around noon today it was reported that the police were searching for two alleged Salafists. These two men, known by the police as terrorist threats, are suspected of placing the bag in the station on Monday. Two students identified them in a photo. Now the two men with the nom de guerre Dahir and Bou are being sought throughout Germany. I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, talking today about climate change and fracking, which always sounds rather like a swear word. From the warmth of the Wahhabi Muslim state of Qatar last week, back to wet Welsh Wales, and then to a frosty socialist Strasbourg over the last few days, my carbon footprint recently is so huge that I'm beginning to wonder if the failure of the forecast beast from the east to plunge us all into the hardest winter in a hundred years is actually down to me. Or there again, the newspapers might just have made it all up to boost sales. We're all suckers for a white Christmas, after all. The reason for that, by the way, is Charles Dickens. Born in 1812, the young Charles grew up during one of the periods in which the natural fluctuation of solar activity led to a series of unusually cold winters. So when he came to write about winter weather in novels such as A Christmas Carol, Dickens drew on the harsh winters he'd known as a boy. This in turn influenced the imagery of the burgeoning and Christmas card industry, and ever since then, a proper Christmas has been whiter than the seasonal norm. At this point, you may sense a lecture on the non-existence of man-made global warming coming on, but you'd be wrong. The only thing I've got to say about that this week is that I was pleased to see that, after the Daily Mirror attacked me for the unspeakable sin of climate change denial, every single person bar one who posted on the Mirror's online comments section said that they agreed with me. The public have seen through this elite scam big time already. Now all we need to do is to get them to realise that the insane war on carbon is costing half as much again as the entire UK police budget. And that the Climate Change Act, which will lead to the complete deindustrialisation of Britain, was supported by every Tory, Lib Dem and Labour MP bar two. The political class will become more and more vulnerable on this issue the more damage their criminal folly does to the living standards of ordinary people. Only three recognisable figures in British politics stand out on the same side as the people in this one. Lord Monckton, who to his credit managed to get thrown out of the Doha conference last week, me and Nigel Lawson. Lawson is now also pretty sound on the EU, with criticisms of the Federalist agenda that more than make up for his failed attempt, while Tory Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1989, to join the exchange rate mechanism, the precursor to the euro. But just because he's right on global warming, and now fairly right about Europe, doesn't mean that Lord Lawson is right on anything else. He's a committed globalist. He did more than any other politician to open Britain up to privatisation looting and to set the banksters free to create the financial boom and bust, which is now recognised as having cost us more than a good old-fashioned world war. He was wrong on all those things, and now he's horribly wrong in his high-profile advocacy of gas fracking too. He's not the only one. George Osborne, David Cameron and Nigel Farage also join him on the list of Tory frackheads. Yes, you heard me right. Nigel Farage may pose as a nationalist, but in reality, he and his BBC-hyped party are nothing more than a splintered faction of the free trade screw the workers wing of the Conservative Party. When internationalist Tories like Lawson and Farage start using nationalist arguments about self-sufficiency, you immediately know they're lying and try to cover up their real agenda. Shale fracking probably does have the capacity to produce a lot of gas in Britain, although for geological reasons it's by no means certain that the recoverable quantities are anything like those which have indeed revolutionised energy production in the USA. And what is environmentally and politically possible in the vast open spaces of the United States is entirely different to what can or should be done in Britain, one of the most crowded countries in the world, but still blessed with the beautiful historic and natural landscapes that make Blake's words about our green and pleasant land so emotive. 
Some of the claims made in the anti-fracking film Gasland may well be exaggerated, but the sheer scale of genuine local opposition to fracking in America has to be contrasted with the attitude of communities living near the supposedly even more controversial technology of nuclear power near places like Sizewell in Suffolk or Sellafield in Cumbria. The contrast is dramatic. Where people see nuclear power up close, they judge for themselves that the alarmist propaganda of the watermelon greens is hogwash. But where people are forced to live near gas fracking, they find out for themselves that the reassuring claims and promises of the oil and gas industry and their bought and paid for political puppets are worse than worthless. Crashing property prices, polluted air and water, earth tremors, the devastation and industrialization of the landscape, extensive reports of animal deaths and human illnesses, these are the day-to-day -day reality of fracking. If the political class have been shaken by popular hostility to fairly useless, but also largely, unless you're a bird or a bat, harmless wind farms, they're going to get a shock when they start fracking up our country. Which is what the Tories and UKIP want to do on a vast scale. Current estimates are that more than half of the entire countryside of Great Britain is a potential target for the frackers. Scotland, the North East, Yorkshire, Lancashire, Cheshire, Staffordshire, Wales, Dorset, Hampshire, Sussex and Kent, all these and more are due to be carved up for exploration licenses, test drilling and devastation. Think for a moment of one of the most beautiful landscapes near you. Picture multiple drilling platforms every half mile. Visualise reservoirs full of polluted fracking fluid near each platform. Hear not just the fracking explosions, but the 1,000 lorries need to build every wellhead thundering through the lanes and villages. Imagine the fear of leaks, spills and explosions that local residents have to live with every day. Then imagine it just a few years later, because this is the ultimate boom and bust industry, summed up in three words, loot, pollute and scoot. The contractors move on. The wellheads are broken up and scrapped. But will the poison reservoirs have been drained, cleaned and restored? Will the wells be properly sealed and safe, despite rusting pipes and concrete rot? Don't bet on it, because the business structure favoured by the giant companies, Halliburton, Shell and all the rest of the frackers, is to hide behind so-called SMEs. We are asked to believe that the process of drilling thousands of feet into the ground then drilling sideways, then using high pressure chemical depth charges to fracture the bedrock, then extracting the gas and sending it off through hundreds of miles of pipeline is all being done by small and medium enterprises. Pull the other one, it's got Christmas jingle bells on it. Fracking is a big boys operation. So why are they hiding behind little guys? Because these globalist sharks are using the legal fiction of small, limited liability companies without any assets to do the dirty work. The frackers are insulating themselves from the burden of cleaning up the mess and the risk of ruinous lawsuits when it emerges that poisonous chemicals are leaking into freshwater aquifers, creating an environmental disaster that can never be undone. So why would Tories like Osborne, Cameron, Lawson and Farage want to take such risks? Partly, of course, it's about money, the desperate urge of big capital and big government for profits and taxes. But behind that, there's also geopolitics. The Tory party, including its UKIP splinter, is wholly beholden to its ideological mentors and, more important, its financiers in the US-based neocon movement. The driving purpose of the neocons is to maintain US dominance of the world and of global energy supplies. A key neocon target is therefore Russia, particularly as Russia under Putin has displayed a pesky desire for independence from the global power elite. Russia's rising global influence is largely based on her position as a huge energy exporter, with particular clout coming from the fact that large parts of Central and Western Europe depend on Russian gas to run their industries and heat their homes. The neocons want to bring Russia to heel, and reassert their dominance. That's why they took us to war in Afghanistan in order to build the Tappy pipeline so that Turkmenistan gas could reach American allies without going through Russia. 
and it's why they're so desperate to find new energy sources. Which is why the Tories and UKIP intend to turn your best loved piece of our green and pleasant land into a post-industrial dead zone and are willing to lose several million rural and small town votes to do so. All this despite the fact that a combination of next generation nuclear or even better thorium power combined with ocean and geothermal electricity production feeding into a hydrogen based transport network could give us clean and affordable energy and enormous numbers of new jobs forever. What a prize to throw away just to have a go at Russia just because President Putin refused to allow a gang of oligarchs to continue to rob his country blind. The same anti-Slav mania reared its ugly head in Parliament this week with a debate about future relations between the EU and Ukraine, in which the old allegation about Ukraine's allegedly unfair elections surfaced once more. As is often the case, I was pleased to be able to offer a common sense counter view to the prevailing orthodoxy. Having attended October's Ukrainian parliamentary elections, in which, incidentally, the nationalists won some 10% of the vote, I was able to tell the handful of MEPs who could be bothered to attend the late evening debate that if they want to complain about undemocratic and unfair elections, they need look no further than Britain, where the Labour Party especially could give Zimbabwe, let alone Eastern Europe, lessons in how to corrupt democracy. One final point of note from Strasbourg this week was the formal receipt of the EU's Nobel Peace Prize. According to Herr President Schultz, the EU's glorious leader, who, in my admittedly biased opinion, looks like Lenin and sounds like Hitler, this absurd award is to all MEPs. We're all winners, isn't that nice? So, taking him at his word, I went and had my photo taken, proudly holding my Nobel Peace Prize medal. I'll let you into a secret. When it comes to big gold coins, I'd rather have a chocolate one in my Christmas stocking. But never mind, I'm sure that more than a few liberals will get all bitter and twisted and foamy at the mouth when they learn about the evil griffin laying hands on one of their prize bits of liberal internationalist bullshit. So that's a good end to another week. Thanks for listening and have a good weekend yourself. Thank you, Nick. As ever, thought-provoking for the weekend. World News. American communist, Islamofascist sympathizers are wringing their hands over 2011 Muslim hate crime stats. From the radical leftists in the Southern Poverty Law Center, we learn that the FBI numbers for anti-Muslim hate crimes in the U.S. are about the same for 2011 as they were in 2010, when there was an unprecedented 50% spike. What they choose not to highlight is the fact that anti-Jewish hate crimes are still about five times higher than anti-Muslim hate crimes. FBI hate crimes motivated by religious bias accounted for 1,318 offences reported by law enforcement. A breakdown of the bias motivation of religious bias offences showed 62.2% were anti-Jewish, 13.3% were anti-Islamic. 5.2% were anti-Catholic, 4.8% were anti-multiple religious groups, 3.7% were anti-Protestant, 0.3% were anti-atheism, agnosticism, etc., and 10.5% were anti-other religion. A proposed army manual tells GIs not to insult the Taliban or speak up for women. A proposed new handbook for Americans serving in Afghanistan warns them not to speak ill about the Taliban, advocate women's rights or criticise paedophilia, and the general in charge is not happy with it. The draft of the newest army handbook seems to suggest that ignorance of Afghan culture is to blame for deadly attacks by Afghan soldiers against the coalition forces, according to the Wall Street Journal, which got a peek at a 75-page document but its message of walking on eggshells around locals is not going down well, with U.S. Marine General John Allen, top military commander in Afghanistan. General Allen did not author, nor does he intend to provide, a foreword, said Colonel Tom Collins, a spokesman for the U.S.-led coalition in Afghanistan. He does not approve of its contents. More than three dozen attacks by Afghan soldiers have claimed the lives of some 63 members of the U.S.-led coalition this year. 
The inside attacks could jeopardise plans to, to transfer full security control to Afghan forces in 2014. China to overtake the EU and US by 2030, US intelligence says. The era of American and European economic dominance has less than two decades left to run, according to a report by US intelligence services. The study, Global Trends 2030, predicts the Chinese economy will overtake the US at some point between 2022 and 2030. It says the once dominant trio of the US, Europe and Japan will see their share of world trade falls from 56% to well below half in 2030. It also notes that China and India are not the only rising Asian countries to tilt the balance of world power from west to east. Its section on Europe offers a bleak view of the impact of the sovereign debt crisis. The Eurozone crisis has laid bare the tensions and divisions between member states and, for the first time in decades, raised fundamental questions about Europe's future, it says, adding that the post-crisis union would not resemble today's Europe. Its scenarios for the Eurozone include the collapse of the Euro and then the EU itself. But it also sees the possibility of EU leaders making a federalist push, leading to a European resistance. A World Date writer comments, This is nothing new. The West for years have been pushing money and work into these new tiger economies. What do they expect when they play God with countries? If you cease manufacturing in Europe and import and pay for crap to be made abroad and still come into your country, don't complain if the eastern countries make hay while the sun shines. Belafonte put Obama's critics in gulags. All who oppose the agenda of Barack Obama, or rather oppose the agenda of his globalist handlers, should be rounded up and imprisoned, singer and social activist Harry Belafonte recently told the ambulance chaser Al Sharpton on the death merchant General Electric's network, MSNBC. Belafonte's comment reveals the true nature of the progressive. It differs little from that of the communist thug, who has zero tolerance for any opposition. Belafonte's mindset ultimately terminates in purges, cultural revolutions and death camps. South Africa, 2,500 white farmers murdered since 1994. According to the South African Human Rights Commission, about 2,500 farmers have been killed since 1994. According to Genocide Watch, this figure stands at over 3,000 white farmers have been murdered since 94. Genocide Watch goes on to say, the South African police have not made investigation and prosecution of these farm murders a priority, dismissing them as crimes by common criminals. The government has disbanded the commando units of white farmers that once protected their farms and has passed laws to confiscate the farmers' weapons. Disarmament of a targeted group is one of the surest early warning signs of future genocidal killings. The latest murder is of former Londoner Chris Priest who recently emigrated to South Africa to open an owl sanctuary. He was attacked by three Africans with machetes and was killed. His 56-year-old wife was brutally stabbed seven times, had a fractured skull, but survived. Thought for the day, Miss Andre and how our media uses it. I have received a lot of texts on the article in the mail on Esther Walker's double-page spread on not wanting a baby boy. Her opinions are a towering crass example of misandry, the male equivalent of misogyny, which is so embedded in our societies, schools, music charts, television programs and newspapers that it frequently goes unnoticed. But they are opinions to which she's entitled, although I do not agree with them all. In the same way, I do not agree with leaving out baby girls to die in China or aborting them in some religions in this country. Or the polite word is choosing or planning a baby. Part of the worthwhile part of giving birth is not the awful gut-wrenching pain, but the surprise at the end of it. That is, which sex baby, hopefully one or the other but not both, you have produced. And to produce, I'm using the old-fashioned way of push and using a man or husband preferably to start this process off in the first place. Just call me old-fashioned. Now, for years in the Western media, men have been sliding off the scale, and even I, although never a stalwart woman's liver, have been heard to utter the immortal words, sodding men no bloody good at anything. But of course they are, bless their little hearts, and I mean little. Men and women are different, very different in basic thought processes and actions. Viva la difference. If I wanted someone who thought like me, I'd have a partnership with another woman, which is my idea of hell. Imagine all that nagging. 
But seriously, men have a bad or a toxic image in Western European culture now, if they are white. But we have spoken on that many times. Esther is a victim of her own generation and simple enough to think writing one's honest thoughts do any good. They do not, but the papers love it. Rather like the celebrity they've made of the woman who thought she was too beautiful, she can utter what she likes now and get paid for it. I cannot understand Esther's hatred of little boys. For the most part, they are the product of their mothers. Girls favour fathers and boys favour mothers. So if she is worried that her son will become an animal-torturing, woman-battering thicket, she needs to look closer at her male relatives. One of the texts I received was from our European reporter, and it went thus. A bigot in a bra. A male writer responds to Esther Walker's toxic and chauvinistic admission that she doesn't want to give birth to a little boy. This week, Esther Walker, wife of celebrity food critic Giles Corlin, wrote a lacerating opinion piece about her casual sexism towards men and boys. The article, which no doubt delighted the likes of Harriet Harman and Suzanne Moore, garnered more than 1,400 reader comments and sparked global offence from both genders after it poured vitriol on her unborn child for possibly being male. I can only deal with one man in my life, and sometimes that's one too many, she spewed, probably over some middle-class macaroons or an elderflower tort. I know very little about boys, but what I have seen I really haven't liked. Boys are gross. They attack their siblings with sticks, are obsessed with toilets, casually murder local wildlife, and turn into disgusting teenage boys and then boring, selfish men. She then said she would die if her baby was born male, claimed that she was deeply, deeply suspicious of little boys, before describing them as the dreaded gender. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what I call a bigot in a bra. And in my opinion, she's a disgrace. I'm afraid I have to agree with that one. She's falling into the modern trap of denigrating something she might regret later. What happens if the poor little brat sees this when he's old enough to read? The anti-male chauvinism is rife in the progressive society that is being foisted on us from the establishment. I even have it from my erstwhile stalker, who is a charming Asian guy, who thinks women should rule the world. Well, I cannot say that we are not better at certain things, giving birth and office administration being two of them, that men seem unable to do. Now, politics, working on roads and finances, should be prevalent in the male species, as they are very good at it. Now, there is a book soon to be published called How to Choose a Husband by Suzanne Venker, a conservative pundit and author. She takes her perspectives on men, women and marriage, which she sums up as the war on men, to the women and a male guest of The View on ABC television. I quote, We are teaching women that equality means sameness. If you are trying to be like a man, you'll end up doing this. If we want lasting love, we should be allowed to have women act with femininity and men with masculinity. Venka's book on how to choose a husband will be published on February the 5th, 2013. The book details that it's been 40 years since the sexual revolution and the women of America have everything they want. Everything, that is, except a husband. Women may be schooled in the art of sex, but they've failed in the art of love. The book explains it isn't surprising. The modern generation is living in a culture that isn't the least bit interested in helping them get hitched. For decades, women have been taught to sleep around indiscriminately, to pursue an education and career at all costs, and never to depend on a man. As a result, women delay marriage indefinitely or ignore it altogether, as though marriage has no bearing on their happiness, as though it were a nice idea or a nice accompaniment to an otherwise satisfying life. This is unprecedented worldwide. Until recently, women have always mapped out their lives according to what they considered their most important role, wife and mother. Today, women plan their entire futures around big careers, and husbands and children come last. Now this is right and leads us to another article in the Mail yesterday where a career woman states it's awful to be 48 alone and desperate. But the page before states from an Olympic star never give up your dreams for a man, he'll repay you by breaking your heart. Now as to the Olympic star, as I did not watch those games, I haven't a clue, but she's obviously in the throes of anger over her husband leaving her. There follow stories on how other women have given up their careers, have been ditched in turn for another trophy wife. 
This, ladies, is par for the course. Men do that. That is what they do and have done for generations. In fact, in Europe, men of a certain station were expected to have a mistress and a wife. In fact, between me and all my listeners, I had a proposal many years ago from a Spaniard whose father had been mayor of Tenerife. And he said, although I would be on the large banana plantation with my two existing children, and possibly our children, he would keep a mistress in town. But that is his way of life. I thought very carefully and decided I could not live like that. But of course, looking back on that, at least he was honest. Whereas today, men do the same thing, but give up their families for it. So which is better? But men do have bad press, and it's all manufactured. On a Tonight report on prison rehabilitation, the cons concerned were all white, but when they showed the prison population en masse, it was spot the white face. So is it only white men who offend and re-offend? The police have a pro-white Kodak moment as well, always describing men as white, but rarely, if ever, unless in a mixed-race gang, as black, Asian or mixed race. Add this to the indoctrination of women being told they are worth it and can have it all, and we have a double standard in society that's costing us our country. Strangers are outbreeding us, not out-abortioning us. They are marrying and producing sons, not living in an office and going home to nothing. They're staying by their children and seeing they are educated in their own culture, not ours. Their husbands make sure there's money for them, even if they do fiddle the benefits, whereas we whites are taxed and means-tested for every single penny. They make sure they get homes to breed in, whereas our so-called breeders are usually single. They rarely marry out, so their children are relatively normal unless they marry their cousins, and then the government look after them, but the singles' children are usually half caste from some other ethnic group on the poverty scale. So it would seem that whilst the odds against men are stacking up, we do not help ourselves in any way. We take notice of the media and TV too much. Life is not a celebrity trip in the jungle, and believe me, time flies, and before you know it, that artificial tan is slipping on loose flesh, the old legs are wobbling around on stilettos, and your hair resembles a candy floss lolly. Now where is that perfect man and perfect child? I'm not, of course, suggesting you go out and find the nearest wife beater or drunk, but that rather tubby bald bloke at the bar is starting to look a lot better than a few years ago, isn't he? Bring on the mistletoe. And finally, goat in boots. The recent wet weather has affected Maisie the goat at Maria's Animal Shelter in Probus, Cornwall, as she suffers from arthritis, and the rain has left 12-year-old Maisie constantly squelching round in puddles and mud. To help her, the keepers have provided Maisie with pink wellies to protect her from foot rot, the animal equivalent of trench foot. This presenter says Maisie looks quite at home in her pictures, and her bright pink wellies are a fashion statement for hooves, a regular goat in boots. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy, safe and warm weekend. <laughs>